Hey, welcome along to Life Switch Online. It is so great to have you with us today. As always, can we just ask for a quick favor? Can you please comment in this comment section below and let us know that you're here. We just love to help people connect with one another and it goes a long way when, um, our, our, when you can just put your name in the comments below and say hi to some other people. It makes such a big difference. So we'd really appreciate it if you could do that. Also, hey, if you're a mum watching, can we just say happy Mother's Day. We love you, we salute you, and we hope today is a day that you really can be celebrated. What I've observed when it comes to mums is that their brains sort of never stop going. They're always thinking about their kids and they carry so much responsibility and they do so much of the work when it comes to raising the kids and, and ensuring that they're set up for a successful future. And so we just want to celebrate you if you're a mum, man. We thank you, thank you, thank you for what you're doing. We also know sometimes it can be a thankless task. It can feel tireless, like you're going, you're going, you're going, and all you get is attitude back. So if you're in that stage of life where your kids might be at that age where there's a lot of attitude coming back, can we just say, hang in there, man, we're cheering you on, we're championing you, man, we love you, and we so want to just honor you today. Hey, and if you're watching this summer, you might have a light bulb moment going off right now. It's Mother's Day and I haven't done anything. Hey, make sure you do. Give her a quick phone call right now. Make a plan to drop into the supermarket or to the mall and get her something. Go around and see her because, hey, we don't want to be that person that forgets Mother's Day. All right, so mums, have a great day. Actually, here's a really good idea. If you are in that place, you go, man, I need to get my mum something. Can I tell you that in two weeks' time, we've got the girls' night out happening up here at Life Switch. And so this is for the ladies. So that's why it's a great Mother's Day gift if you start. Get your mum a ticket. Tickets are $20, but the best thing about this is one ticket actually comes with two. That if you buy a ticket, you get another one to bring a friend along. It's a, going to be an incredible night with Julia Grace. Um, I've been speaking with Naomi this week and just hearing about some of the plans that the team's put together and just, man, it's sounding absolutely phenomenal. It's going to be such a special event. And so if, if you're a lady, can I encourage you to get your tickets? If you haven't got one something, there is a perfect idea. Start thinking, who can I bring along? Because it's going to be so good. And then on that Sunday, Julie is going to join us for church and be teaching on the Sunday morning. So it's going to be a special, special weekend. And personally, man, I'm so looking forward to it. And I hope that you can take advantage of all that it has to offer. It's going to be a great weekend um, just up here at Life Switch. All right, let's move on. Eh? We are now in week three of our series called The Origin, A Journey Through Acts. And I really hope that you've been able to follow with us. Um, if you've been around for the last couple of weeks as we've been working through Acts a chapter a day and, and just really reading the story. Because again, as I've said, on a, on a Sunday, I can talk to a little bit of what's going on, but I think so much of the detail, so much of the experience is actually found in working through Acts on a daily basis as we go through this. And if you've done your reading for today, you'll know that we're in Acts 15. And I'm excited because today I want to do a deep dive into Acts 15 and to just draw out some things that I think are so fundamental to our faith and to the way that the church should be operating in our day and in our age. But before we get to that, let's just rewind and have a quick look at what we've covered in the last two weeks, because this really helps us set the scene for what's going to come today. Oh, okay. In week one, we, we had a look into Acts chapter one, didn't we? And we had a look into Acts chapter one. In Acts chapter one, there's a really, really powerful verse. And that verse, it, it says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what's fascinating about this is that it sort of starts central. You will tell people about Jerusalem, then it's going to go wider to Judea, then to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And if you actually read through Acts, you'll sort of see that that's the blueprint that the entire book ends up taking. It starts in Jerusalem, and it slowly gets wider. And then last week in week two, we looked at the message that these um, early Christians, these early disciples, were sharing. And what you'll see in that message is this, the message that they gave over and over and over and over and over again was a real simple message. It was just went like this. God sent him, you killed him, God raised him, 
and we are witnesses. And this was the message we saw over and over and over. So as they were sharing this message and it was going out wider and wider and wider, what you see through the book of Acts is that consistently more and more people are turning to Jesus. And what makes this so remarkable is that this wasn't happening centuries after Jesus died. This was happening weeks after Jesus died, was resurrected, then sort of ascended back to heaven. So when they're saying this message, the people around them know the story. They were there, some of them, in the crowds when Jesus was killed. They heard the buzz going around that God raised Jesus from the dead and that he has walked among us again. And the people saying, they were saying, we were witnesses, we saw this. And then what happened, that message started to go further and further and further and further and further. And what happens in Acts 15 is what's known as the council at Jerusalem. And, and to, to put a bit of context, we'll actually see the context of this as we dive straight into Acts 15. But it is such a special council. And the way that, that the council, this group of people got together to make a decision is so, so powerful and helps us understand just some of the central claims of Christianity. So let's dive together into Acts chapter 15. It starts like this. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. So at this point in Acts, um, Saul became Paul, who'd become a Christian, right? Saul, who was out there persecuting the Christians. And isn't it so powerful to read his own, like, sort of conversion account in the book of Acts? It's amazing. Paul and Barnabas, they were in Antioch. They spent a bit of time in Antioch, and they're, they're, they're with the, the Christians that are there building up the church, helping people come to faith. And so while they're there, some other Christians came in from Judea and arrived, and they began to teach the believers that were there. And this is one of the things that they taught. Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. So, so these Christians are coming in and what they're saying is actually if you really want to have a relationship with God, if you really are a follower of Jesus, you need to be, for the males, circumcised. And, and what this really points to is, is, is not just circumcision but the willingness and the want to follow all the law of Moses, which is outlined in the Old Testament of our scriptures. And so these people are coming in and saying, hey, Jesus came, yes, Jesus is real, yes, but if you really want to follow him, you need to behave in accordance with and in alignment with the law of Moses. And what we're told <laughs> next is, 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 is so fascinating. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them and they argued vehemently. There was passionate debate from Paul and Barnabas. That is not true. That is wrong. You do not need to follow the customs of the law of Moses in order to be a Christian, in order to have your faith and your trust in Jesus. So you've got Paul and Barnabas who have been working with the locals for a long time, preaching a, a very simple message, right? Like we talked about last week, that that. Jesus was sent from God, that you killed him, but God raised him and we are witnesses. And remember the next steps from us. So what do they encourage people to do? Repent of your sin, turn to God, be baptized, and that promise that you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so that was the message that they were saying. But then these other believers are coming and saying, no, 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 no. What we've got to add to this isn't simply that you believe that, that you, that you repent of your sin and turn to God. What you have to also do is follow the law of Moses. So this is quite a challenging sort of suggestion because there is so much law in there. And in particular with the example they used for men was that in order to become a follower of God, you have to undertake a special type of surgery, which I guess would see a lot of women and kids maybe coming to faith, but the boys and the dads are probably more content to say, hey, I'm going to sit this one out. You go into the new believers class. I'm going to stay in the car because, man, I don't know if I'm ready for that sort of surgery. So let's look at what happens next. Finally, because of this disagreement, the church decides to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, to, to, to the central place where the, the apostles are still located, accompanied by some of the local believers to talk to those apostles and the elders about this question. See, this question was fundamental because the message that was shared initially was simply this, right? God sent Jesus, you killed him, 
God raised him and we are witnesses. And they're saying, hey, remember what you've got to do is repent from your sins, turn to God, get baptized and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. You remember, so those were the next steps. But what these believers are doing is saying, actually, no, 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 there's, there's a whole other set of next steps you've got to put in place. You have got to follow all the laws of Moses. And these laws covered so much. They covered what you would eat. They covered what you could wear. They covered what to do when you were sick. They covered um, meal preparation. They covered stuff to do with hygiene. They covered stuff around sexual, sexual ethic. They covered so, so much. There was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of laws. And, and the big one that really was, was that one that was talked about before was circumcision because that was so painful and so in your face, especially for the men. So Paul and Barnabas, they head off to Jerusalem. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church. So everyone in Jerusalem was excited to see Barnabas and Paul when they turned up, the apostles and the elders included in that. And Paul and Barnabas reported everything that God had done through them. Because Paul and Barnabas had been traveling, they'd been working around on a missionary journey is, is what it's often referred to, but they'd spent a bit of time at the end of this journey, or they'd spent a bit of time at Antioch, and that was where they got sent back from. But some of the believers, and this is phenomenal, this, just, and just look at the power it says, but some of the believers who belong to the sect of the Pharisees. Did you know what? so remarkable about this in the gospels the writings of jesus's life matthew mark luke and john that there's often jesus over here and the pharisees over here and they were pitted against each other that the pharisees despised jesus what this tells us is that some of the believers who belong to the sect of the pharisees that these pharisees the people who begged for jesus to be killed the people who wanted jesus gone became believers that, that these Pharisees, and these are the people that knew the law of Moses super well. They were the ones who added laws on top of laws to ensure people didn't go close to breaking the law. Okay, The Pharisees were dead against Jesus. But what this tells us is that some of those Pharisees actually became believers. They heard the message that God sent him. They saw the fact, and they were probably responsible for the fact that Jesus was killed and they heard the eyewitness account that God has raised him from the dead and they became believers. See that the Pharisees would have known the entire Old Testament so well, not just the law of Moses, but they would have known the teachings of the prophets. And as Peter and as others started to help people draw the picture between what the prophets were saying and the life of Jesus, they would have said, actually, yes, the Old Testament, these prophets did point to Jesus being our Messiah. And so this just blows my mind that these people that were so against Jesus ended up becoming believers in Jesus. So some of the believers who were from the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. I was saying, we followed this for generation upon generation upon generation upon generation upon generation. God, the same God that sent Jesus, gave us this law. Therefore, it would make sense that this law continues through even now that Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, has come. So the apostles and the elders met together to resolve the issue. What is the role of the law of Moses moving forward is really that big issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, this wasn't come into the room and someone's going to stand up and make a rule. And this was a lot of conversation. There was a long discussion going on. People speaking about this and this and this and this. And we don't get all the detail of what took place. But what we do get told it was a long discussion. Peter stood up. So everyone's been talking and and Peter really was, you know, one of the people that was primed to be the leader of the early church, right? Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God has chosen me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. See, by this 
time where you can you would have read if you've been reading through Acts Peter's had a massive heart transformation in terms of of his engagement with the Gentiles they've seen the Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit the same way as they did so what Peter's really seen now is that Gentiles and Jews are now on the same level he made no distinction between us and them for he cleansed their hearts through faith we can see where Peter is going to land this thing, right? He says, so why are you now challenging God? And this is powerful. By burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear. This is what Peter's saying. Peter's saying, look, look. Us and our ancestors have tried to bear the weight of the law for our entire lives. And he's saying, look, we couldn't do it. We, we couldn't bear that. We, we couldn't live up to the law so why are we trying to put on their backs the weight of a law that we can't even carry peter's saying there's something wrong why are we trying to make them do all this heavy lifting when we can't even do it ourselves we have been brought up with these laws from little kids and we can't even live up to them so why are we going to ask others who know nothing about them to try and pick them up later in life then he says this we believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. It's got nothing to do with who we are and how we behave. It's, it's we can have a relationship with God, a right standing with God. We have been saved because of the grace of the Lord Jesus, because he went to the cross, because he was killed, because he laid down his life, because he took upon his shoulders the punishment that belonged to us. He's done it all for us, not we, we haven't got to earn our way to it. Everyone listen quietly. As Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. Just seems a little bit out to the side. Why that verse there, I'm not quite sure whether Paul and Barnabas started telling some good stories because Peter had got a bit of momentum for them going their way and, and they wanted to emphasize the work that God was doing amongst the Gentile community. I imagine was why they spoke up there. When they had finished speaking, James stood up. This is James, the brother of Jesus. James, who wasn't a believer until after Jesus' death. James, who who would have known the the Jewish law and, and grew up in that, but also at some point came to this conclusion about his very own brother, that he was, in fact, the Son of God, which is a remarkably profound place to land it. James stood and James said this, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. They're saying that the prophets predicted that the Gentiles were going to be included in this. And he shares some passages why. But then he makes it this statement. And this is what I want us to lock in on. And James says, And so it is my judgment that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. He's saying they don't need to adhere to the law. Circumcision is not a requirement. And and the principle behind it is this. We should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. That's really the decision time. (laughs) We should not make it difficult. And this is what I believe we need to hold on to so close for those of us who are Christians today, for those of us that, that, are, that are building the church today, and, and, and for those that are, that are thinking about faith, this is so vital because these early leaders of the early church got together and their conclusion, their principle was we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles, for people who want to be turning to God. And do you know what's happened, unfortunately, in the 2,000 years since? Oftentimes, over and over and over and over again, well-intentioned Christians like you and like me, we make things difficult sometimes for people who are turning to God. We create lists in our head. If someone wants to turn to God, they have to do this and do that, and, and they have to know the answers to this, and they have to be able to memorize this, and they have to be able to do this, and they should do this course and that course, and they should be able to articulate this thing and that thing. But what we see here so clearly is this principle coming through that says, hey, we should not make it difficult for people wanting to turn to God. We've got to keep it simple. We've got to make it easy for those that are turning to God. That is so powerful. That is so special. 
And for some of us that have been around Christian circles for longer, we've got to go, man, what do I often put in place? Where, where do I add things to this? What is it that I'm looking for before I'd say, man, you are now all right with God? Because it's so easy for you and for me to add things to the list of what someone needs to believe or what someone needs to be doing outwardly in order to say that they have turned to God. Let's continue through Acts 15. Instead, so this is James continuing, instead we should write and we should tell these people to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. So what's interesting here is, is James is saying, actually, there's a few things we're going to tell those Gentile believers to do. There's four. Three of them have to do with food. One has to do with sexual immorality. Don't eat food offered to idols. Don't eat the meat of strangled animals. And don't consume blood. And, and also... Don't engage in sexual immorality. He, he breaks all these laws down and he keeps these four for some reason. And what I want to do is just help us unpack why he keeps these four. Three about food, one about sexual immorality. But let me just keep reading because the passage that comes through really nicely. He says, For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. The apostles and the elders got together with the whole church in Jerusalem and they chose delegates and they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. The men chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas and Silas. This is the letter they took with them. So again, they scribed a letter out that these believers went back with Paul and Barnabas to the people in Antioch and this is what the letter said. We understand some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. <laughs> well, they're distancing themselves from these guys. So we decided having come to complete agreement to send official representatives. This is an official ruling. This is an official piece of paper, official documentation from the apostles, from the elders back in Jerusalem. that their representatives are going to come back along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are sending Judas and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. And again, we see those same four requirements here. You abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Fear well. There's not a lot of explanation in there, but if you do these four things, you will do well. Now, why would these be included? Here is what I believe based on all the research and the reading stuff that I can do into this. The, the first three are all about food. And the reason that, that, that scholars would say that, that these were included in there isn't because the food was necessarily wrong for the people to eat. In fact, remember, in Acts, Peter had that dream, right, about the food that was unclean. You're actually able to eat that now. And, and so it's, it's really hard to get your head around why would they keep this in there. The reason scholars would tell you they kept those three requirements around the food in there was because of, or was for the sake of unity of the church. We don't want to have two churches. We don't want to have one church out here that's happy to eat what they want and will eat all this stuff and have another church out here that won't. And then the reason that could take place is because even for the Jewish people who might now know, man, I know we weren't allowed to eat that food under the law of Moses, but we're now able to. What's considered unclean is, is now um, we're able to eat is when you've been brought up not able to do something being told that's bad that's horrible being told that that is like just something that you couldn't do it's unconscionable when not only have you been brought up with that but it's been like that in your sort of history for generation upon generation upon generation it is very very hard to simply switch and start to engaging in something like that maybe you were brought up and you were told something was wrong, something that, that to this day, you're like, you kind of know it's not wrong, but you still can't bring yourself to do it 
because of just you were told over and over and over through your childhood, through your teenage years, that it was wrong. That is really what's going on here. So the Jews had this way of eating, the, the type of food that they would avoid, and, and the Gentiles were well, they were happy to engage with that. But what the, the leaders of the church knew was, well, if half the people are going to do it and a whole lot aren't, it's going to get really messy when they come together. So for the sake of unity, we are going to ask you to lay aside some preferences so that everyone can come together and we can have one church. That is really what the food stuff here has got to do with. It's about the sake of unity. And then the last one, avoid sexual immorality. And again, I, I, I don't know why this one was included so profoundly, but what I can probably make a guess to is, man, you and I know the amount of pain and the amount of hurt and the amount of brokenness that comes because of sexual immorality, right? But like we see it in the world around us all the time. The amount of people that have to deal with trauma, that have to deal with pain, that have to deal with heartache, that have to deal with grief, that have to deal with so much internal hurt because of someone's sexual immorality. See, when the, when the Christian message went out, what Christians were called to do was love one another the way that God has loved us and really when we think through like what sexual immorality is it's, it's very much anything that goes against that basic command and you just think of how many people in the world that you know there's some of the deepest hurt the deepest pain that the biggest regrets they have come about because of someone's whether it's someone else's uh, appearance or their own sexual immorality it's significant so i think the reason that was there is, is, is really because the apostles and those elders knew just the impact that sexual immorality has and for some reason sexual immorality cuts deeper into the soul of a human being than almost any other type of immorality and then i just finish if you do this you will do well the messages went at once to Antioch, where they called a general meeting of the believers. They delivered the letter, and there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. There was great joy. Why was there great joy? Because now the people knew for certain that they didn't have to try and carry this weight. They didn't have to carry the burden of the law that that even those who grew up under it weren't equipped to fully carry. The men in particular were extremely excited because, I mean, they could become followers of Jesus without having to go through a very painful level of surgery. So there was great joy at this encouraging message. You see, we've got the message that we talked about last week, Remain. It is so, so simple. God sent him. You killed him. We saw him because God raised him and we're witnesses of this. That is just the most great, simple, special message that we could ask for. And it's a message of great joy and it's, it's so encouraging because you don't have to follow all these other rules. You don't have to follow all of these other regulations. Hey, hey there, was, there was four things we're asking you to do. Three to do with food, one to do with sexual morality, but that's built around really the unity of the church and looking after one another. But what, what's so fascinating and, and if you're going to read with us for the next few days you, you'll read this really really soon but what this is what i really do believe is so remarkable that they're not long after this ruling's gone out and you've got paul who's there fighting passionately that people don't need to get circumcised he goes out with timothy and, and paul being a jew would have been circumcised as a kid he goes out with timothy to go and teach people about jesus and as they go, do you know what Timothy decides to do? Timothy decides to get circumcised. Now, and what's, so, what's so amazing about this is Paul is very, very clear, isn't he? That you don't have to get circumcised in order to be a follower of Christ, yet he is probably a, a leader. He is known as a mentor to Timothy. And Timothy, before he goes on a missionary journey with Paul, decides to take this painful step in order to go out with Paul. Why would Timothy do that? Why would Timothy be willing to and want to, maybe, I don't know, maybe wants too strong of a word, but why would he be willing to have the surgery performed to him 
when his own mentor was there when the decision was made, when his own mentor was one of the people saying, no, 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 you don't have to follow the law in order to be a Christian, in order to be a follower of Jesus. And the answer is this. Timothy was willing to do it because it would increase his ability to reach the people he was going to reach. Did you get that? Timothy was willing to forgo personal like comfort in order to reach the people he wanted to reach. He was willing to lay aside his own personal preferences in order to increase his effectiveness at sharing the message of Jesus. He was willing to undergo extraordinary surgery simply so he would have more influence with the people to whom he was going to. One of the things Paul says, right, is I have become all things to all people so that I may win some. And, and what we see is just the incredible commitment that these early Christians had to going out and reaching people, to saying, hey, look, look, this might not be what I want, but I'm willing to do it because it's going to give me more influence. This might not be my preference, but if that's what's going to lead to us having a more powerful message, I'm willing to do it. And I think, again, for those of us who are Christians, we have so much to learn in this space. Because often we'd be the first to put our hands saying, that's not required, I don't have to do it, I'm not going to do it, it's not the law doesn't involve it. I don't have to do it because it's too uncomfortable, because I don't like it, I'm not doing it. But I think what was going through Timothy's mind was, actually, if I want to have influence with this people group, if I want to impact them, if I want them to understand how much they are loved, then sometimes I've got to lay aside my personal preferences and do things that I don't want to do in order to give me that level of influence with them. And, and I honestly think, as a church, individually and collectively. Sometimes we've got to be willing to say, man, this might not be my preference. This might not be how I like things done. This might not be how I want to see things happen. This is putting a bigger burden on me. This is asking me to carry more responsibility. This is asking me to do more than I should have to do. This is asking me to go above and beyond. But I'm going to do it because that's going to give me influence with the people that I am called to reach. And that is powerful and that is special because I think what you and I as Christians have got our responsibility to do is is this to do all we can to increase our influence with those that are around us so that we can speak with confidence and with clarity about the love that we have the hope that can be found within us because of what Jesus Christ has done hey let me leave you on that thought why don't we go and check out the song, listen to it, let the words that we've been speaking about maybe just wash over you, the lyrics speak to you and come back because I'd love, love, love to pray for you. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again, I need you. Oh, I need you Walking down the stairs of road Water for my thirsty soul I need you Oh, I need you Your forgiveness Sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my it's like holy water on my skin The dead man walking slits sin I want to know about being born again I need you Oh God, I need you Take me under
Heavenly Father, I thank you that the message that the early disciples put out was so simple and it was so clear as we talked about last week. And Father, I pray that you can help us to ensure that we keep the message simple, that we keep it clear, that we don't overly complicate it, that we don't add to it and make it difficult for those that are turning to you. And Father, I pray for those that might be considering turning to you. I pray for those that wouldn't yet call themselves a Christian. I pray that they'll know the simplicity of the message, that they'll know that you're a God who is so for them, that you're a God who, who really laid the path down, that's taken all the punishment because of your deep, incredible love for them. And Father, I pray that they'll know that, that they too can repent of sin and they can turn to you, just as those early Christians did. And Father, I pray for those of us who are Christians, for those of us that are the church today. I pray you will help us understand just, man, the incredible sacrifice that Timothy was willing to make in order to go and have increased his influence with those that he was called to reach. I pray you'll help us see those times where hey, we don't have to, because of the law, do something but because of our heart for people, because of our passion to see them come to know you, we might be willing to remove our personal preferences, to look past what makes us comfortable and do some things that might make us very uncomfortable in order to increase our influence with those that are around us. I pray that, that just as Timothy was willing to, to, man, become so uncomfortable in order to do what you wanted him to do. I pray that you help us to see those areas of our life where maybe we can set aside our own comfort, not because we're following the law, but simply because man, we've got such a heart to see other people come to know you the way that we know you. I pray we'll do this in Jesus' name. I pray this. Amen. 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 Hey, you have a great, great week ahead. We'll love to catch you again next week as we wrap up our series, The Origin. See you later.